Hello, and welcome to Flexible Application of the Outpatient Guidelines, one of 10 webinars hosted by the Facility Guidelines Institute on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. My name is Heather Livingston. I'm the Director of Operations for FGI and Managing Editor of the 2022 edition of the Guidelines, and I'll be your moderator during today's webinar. FGI is pleased to host this series of continuing education webinars developed to broaden understanding of the guidelines documents, the revision process, and to highlight key changes in the current edition of the guidelines. To obtain AI credit, you'll need to coordinate with the person who registered your organization on MADCAD. That person will be receiving follow-up directions by email. Each attendee seeking AIA learning units must complete a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar in order to receive AIA continuing education credit. The views and opinions expressed during today's presentation are those of the presenters and may not represent the official position of FGI nor the HGRC. And now I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters. John Williams has more than 25 years of experience with healthcare design and regulation. John is the manager of the Washington State Department of Health's Construction Review Program, which is responsible for reviewing licensed healthcare facilities for state licensing, federal certification, and building code requirements. He's the chair of the International Code Council's Healthcare Committee. John also serves on technical committees for FGI's Health Guidelines Revision Committee, NFPA 99, and the Washington State Building Code Council. Kirsten Waltz is a principal in Smith Group's Boston office. Kirsten is experienced in programming, planning, project management, and design of healthcare projects. Her interest in healthcare architecture stems from her genuine desire to improve the patient and staff experiences and better their day-to-day -day lives. With project experience ranging from 5,000 square foot departmental renovations to 450,000 square foot new hospitals, Kirsten is able to address the smallest details while maintaining a broad overview of the entire project. She's a member of the American College of Healthcare Architects and serves as vice chair of the outpatient document group for the Health Guidelines Revision Committee. Welcome John and Kirsten, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. To start off, medical care is provided in many different locations today, with the primary distinction of inpatient and outpatient being the time a patient is treated. Medical treatments and surgeries can be categorized into inpatient and outpatient services, and it is important to understand the difference between these two types of care because they impact the length of a patient's stay in a medical facility and the cost of a procedure. The difference between an inpatient and outpatient care is how long a patient must remain in the facility where they have the procedure done. Inpatient care requires overnight hospitalization. Patients must stay at the medical facility where their procedure was done for at least one night, typically a hospital. During this time, they remain under the supervision of a nurse or doctor. Patients receiving outpatient care do not need to spend a night in a hospital. They're free to leave the doctor's office, outpatient clinic, or hospital clinic once the procedure is over. Sometimes they'll need to wait while anesthesia wears off or to make sure there aren't any complications. As long as there, ain't, there aren't any serious complications, patients don't have to spend the night being supervised. Medical technology advances have allowed for more services to be offered in an outpatient setting. Not spending more or more nights in a medical facility has two main benefits for patients. First, patients are able to recover in the comfort of their own home. And second, outpatient procedures almost always cost less than comparable inpatient procedures. Staying in a hospital overnight for observation isn't cheap and patients can save a lot of money by recovering at home instead of in a hospital room. In many cases, the difference between outpatient and inpatient care is thousands of dollars. Thanks to advances in medical techniques and technology, many treatments and minor surgeries can be performed as outpatient procedures. The guidelines have responded to these changes by providing flexibility through the document. From emergency departments to micro hospitals 
to outpatient settings, the years ahead will see continued changes in how healthcare facilities are designed. The guidelines provide minimum requirements for the rapidly evolving healthcare system. Outpatient facility construction is expected to grow anywhere from 20 to 30% in the next decade. In early 1990s, outpatient care accounted for only 10 to 15% of hospitals revenue, and today it's closer to 60%. The boom in outpatient facility construction shows no signs of slowing. These projects are becoming increasingly complex as medical groups and hospital systems demand spaces that can keep up with their rapidly changing strategic and organizational requirements. It's a shift that's been happening across the board, sweeping along academic medical centers, community hospitals, and for-profit chains, and not-for-profit providers alike, and it's showing no sign of slowing, especially with the advancements in care and changing reimbursement patterns. The rapidly evolving healthcare system requires flexibility within the built environment for efficiency. Services are changing from inpatient to outpatient, and today we'll focus on how the outpatient book provides flexibility between these patient services. In recent years, the guidelines have split from one single document to a set of documents based on facility type. A distinct set of requirements has been identified for hospitals, residential facilities, and outpatient facilities. The blue hospital book focuses on acute care settings. Patients stay overnight, but generally the overall length of stay is relatively short. The red residential book focuses on residential care, where the length of stay is much longer. They are typically settings where residents give ongoing care in a place they reside. The orange outpatient book is the newest addition to the guidelines and covers outpatient facilities where patients receive care for less than 24 hours. The split to three different books reflects the acknowledgement of these facilities operate differently. They serve a different clientele and often have different needs and goals. As such, the inherent risks are not the same. As we realize that as healthcare delivery system continues to change in response to the population needs, reimbursement, and technology, the clear boundaries that these documents imply will begin to blur. With your help, we commit to watching these trends and responding appropriately. These divisions are not meant to squelch innovation. Instead, they are meant to accommodate change by accepting a breadth of difference in facility types and providing a forum for specific conversation about the needs of each. If you design an outpatient department within a hospital setting, you will only need to look at the outpatient book. If you have a department in a hospital setting that provides care for both inpatient and outpatients, you will have to look at the requirements across both books and work with your local authority having jurisdiction to confirm the most stringent approach. So, in terms of organization, the outpatient book is very similar to the hospital and residential documents. Part one is the general section which sort of sets the stage for how the document is used. It covers the basic concepts of planning, design, and commissioning, and this is also where we get information on other reference codes and standards like NFPA 101 or which version of an ANSI document you would use. And it's also where we find the requirements for functional programming and the safety risk assessment. Since it covers such a broad range of concepts and requirements, part one applies to all facilities. Part two gets into the technical requirements. So how big does a room have to be? How many hand wash sinks do you have to have? What is a hand wash sink? What does a hand wash sink look like? Uh, those, those types of requirements. This is also where we list specific requirements for each facility type. Finally, part three speaks to the HVAC and ventilation requirements of the facility. It essentially adopts ASHRAE 170, the standard for ventilation in healthcare facilities. Parts one and parts three are essential, um, but really the bulk of the actual design requirements are in part two. And that's where we'll spend most of our focus in this presentation. 
So in that interest, let's take a closer look at Part 2. The first section of Part 2 is the Common Elements chapter. This is where you'll find a set of requirements for different room types that might occur in any facility type. So a little background on common elements. Um, several years ago, uh, during the code development cycles, uh, the FGI Revision Committee realized that it was really unnecessary to reprint several paragraphs describing how to build an exam room in each of the 12 chapters that had requirements for exam rooms. So instead, they opted to describe an exam room once, then talk about the room size and amenities once. And then that way you can have a signpost in each of the facility chapters that pointed you back to the requirements for this common element. Uh, this change saved a lot of paper, uh, but it also provided some greater consistency and accuracy across the document. So if you're only describing an exam room once in the document instead of 12 times, you've got, you've got a much better chance at making all of those uh, requirements consistent. The next section, uh, set of sections anyway in part two, deal with the individual facility types. As you can see, we've got a pretty comprehensive list here of the typical types of facilities. We have the basics like general clinics, imaging and infusion type facilities, but we also co cover some of the more intensive facilities. And those are the facilities like um, ambulatory surgery, uh, renal dialysis, freestanding emergency. Most of the facilities that you can expect to see out there uh, in the design and construction world are going to be described in one of these 13 sections. As mentioned before, these chapters are going to reference you back to the common elements section, and that's in, in 2.1, when needed to describe a particular element or service. So um, if you have an endoscopy facility and you, you need to understand um, how an exam room in that uh, facility would look, there, that chapter 2.9 is going to reference you back to 2.1. If you're not referenced back to a common element section, you're generally not required to use that section. All of this is, is really intended to support this concept that the guidelines are scalable. And, and that is to say that we don't require a building uh, say only containing uh, physical therapy to look the same as the building that contains an ambulatory surgery center. Most of the codes and standards uh, are like risk management tools and, and the uh, FGI is, is, is similar to that. We identify risks to patients and staff and we compel reasonable mitigations to resolve those risks or at least substantially lessen the risks. But what happens if the building that you're contemplating doesn't really neatly fall into one of these prepackaged categories. Maybe your project combines several of these service types, um, or maybe it's a type of treatment that isn't even really addressed here. What do you do then? So, I think flexibility is the key here. We understand that healthcare moves at a really fast pace. We're aware that healthcare systems are inventing new treatment modalities, inventing new pieces of equipment, and, and just basic healthcare delivery strategies that we can't even imagine yet. So flexibility is the key. And when we were talking about this in the Healthcare uh, Guidelines Revision Committee, um, we wanted to underscore that it's not our intent to paint facilities into a corner and create some unintended consequences and, and restrictions on use. But instead, we wanted to acknowledge that. We wanted to plan for flexibility, and we really tried to build into these rules an a la carte kind of approach um, that identifies risks and then applies mitigation. So to that end, uh, the outpatient book offers two basic approaches to determine which requirements are minimums in your project, approach one and approach two. Approach one, or the single chapter approach, envisions using facility chapter and the common elements chapter in a traditional manner. You need to pay careful attention to categorizations and cross-references if you're going to use this approach. Approach two, or the multi-chapter approach, is a little bit more freeform. It's not as literal as approach one and allows for some variations on use. 
this would really be useful um, for a facility that really doesn't fall neatly into one of those prepackaged categories. So we're going to look at a process um, for, for applying both. First, we're going to start with approach one and take you through a step-by-step -step process of how you would do that. Uh, it's really kind of intuitive, I think. Um, I don't show it here, but I think step zero is uh, always read part one of the document. Uh, it always applies. Um, the real step one here is uh, read the functional program. Uh, and as you go through that functional program, get a sense for what kind of facility is being described. And, and, you know, it's not just the functional program. It's sitting down and working with your client and getting a true understanding of the types of services and the breadth and scope of services that are, that are going to be happening. Step two would then be, once, once you get that, that concept of what this facility is, select the facility type from part two that most accurately relates to that, that planned use. So if I read a functional program and it describes to me an urgent care, I'm going to look through that, those chapters in part two and pick 2.5 urgent care centers. The next step is to read the facility chapter type and then follow all of those references back to the common elements section. So um, if, if I've chosen 2.5 urgent care center because I think that's what this facility is, I'm going to go through 2.5 and it's going to point me back to common elements for certain things like how to build an exam room or um, how to work uh, and develop an HVAC system or a plumbing system. It's really following a code trap line. Um, a references B, which then references C. It's very, very literal. Uh, and the problem with that is it doesn't lead a whole lot of room for interpretation. The good thing is this literal me method uh, is very clear. And you can pick up the book and, and, and use it pretty in a pretty straightforward manner. However, though, this literal method um, doesn't always work for every project. For example, let's imagine a hypothetical project. This is a building, um, and you're, you're working with the facility, and at the start of the project, the client develops a functional program, and you uncover that there might be multiple service categories that want to come together in one location to best serve the goals of the organization or the community uh, that this building is going to be placed in. The outpatient book, this version of the outpatient book, provide some flexibility to co-locate and share those support services. So let's, let's imagine. Uh, let's say this building you have uh, has a general waiting area shown up here in black. Uh, you've got some primary care areas uh, in blue in the wings uh, with some dialysis treatment in the core. And then at the last minute, the uh, owner identifies the need for some infusion beds and you have to shoehorn that into the floor plate. I don't know, Kirsten, as a designer, does this ever happen to you? This happens more often than not. And uh, it's the single chapters um, we aren't seeing as much these days. And I'm going to go through a few case studies at the end of the presentation that will help identify how to navigate through this, um, this second approach. Yeah, and, and as AHJs, we run across this all the time um, because folks are very inventive and um, uh, forward-thinking in the way that they're – clustering services together. Essentially, what we have in this particular case is a hybrid facility or a Frankenstein facility. It's a building with a, a set of service lines that can span several chapters in the FGI. When the revision committee was discussing this concept, we kept using this word picture of a, a Frankenstein monster that um, um, we were talking about. And it's the concept of sticking a lot of non-matching parts together and bolting and sewing them together into a single hole. So the name stuck and that's, and that's why we, we call it the Frankenstein approach. At worst, the single chapter approach, approach one, can be interpreted to say that you can't locate some of these services. At best, the single approach doesn't cover the amalgam of risks and dangers um, to patients uh, that, that patients would encounter in some of these uh, hybrid facilities. The problem for facilities uh, and designers and, and even us AHJs, these types of facilities are, are more common and um, we, we keep seeing them more and more. 
So that's why we included uh, approach two, uh, the Frankenstein or multi-chapter approach. Again, I would uh, go through a step-by-step -step process on, on, on how, how you might use this approach. Again, step zero, uh, read part one of the outpatient book and, and follow all those requirements, those basic set of uh, requirements. Step one uh, is read the functional program, just like the last time. Uh, step two is at that point you recognize um, in the functional program or talking to the facility that this facility covers a wide range of different services and it doesn't really cleanly fit into any one chapter. So if, if I'm reading a functional program and it's a little, a little bit of urgent care, but uh, you've got an outpatient surgery chapter and, and you've got some uh, other general primary care type services, I might raise my hand at that point and say, listen, I've, I've got a hybrid facility here and I think I need um, to look at approach two because that's gonna most adequately cover the facility and not try to do a one size fits all approach. The next step is to um, sit down with your AHJ and determine which appropriate sections apply based on this particular function or set of functions. And I think interaction is the key here. Um, when you do this, I think you need to have a clear, uh, complete functional program that describes all of the services. I think you need to meet early in the design process and, and really have a robust discussion of all of the risks and all of the mitigations um, early on so that you can plan for them. And hopefully, if you do meet with the AHJ and you do have that complete picture of what's gonna happen inside the facility, you're gonna be able to move forward with clear documentation and decisions about what sections of the chapter to apply and which, and which don't. Um, I would say don't always assume the AHJ is going to agree with you um, and, and, and choose not to meet with the AHJ early on. Um, don't try to make decisions in the vacuum because, you know, a well-intentioned design team are, are going to pick the pieces out of the book that um, they're aware of and we, they, they think are appropriate. But as AHJs, we're in the book every day and we might be aware of some other part of the book that might need to apply based on uh, the particular risk in that fine, uh, type of uh, facility. So if we zoom back and, and look at these approaches side by side, um, you can see that approach one is very straightforward. Um, there's probably not going to be a lot of surprises when you work through this. Uh, but with approach two, there's some risk involved. And by that, I mean both the AHJ and the design team have to enter into this discussion where we're not entirely sure what's going to apply uh, to this project. Uh, and we actually drill down to the point of looking at the risk and the mitigations. Um, and we all kind of have to accept the idea that we might end up with a little bit less than, than the traditional approach, but we might end up with a little bit more. Um, Approach one doesn't have to involve a, a lot of interaction, um, I guess, unless you make the wrong choice and go down the wrong branch of the decision tree, but approach two relies on this interaction. So um, that's, that's really important uh, to make that, make that case. So we have a few case studies to go through. And the first uh, case study highlights a space which was the former emergency department which was converted into a 23-hour observation unit combined with an outpatient non-chemo infusion unit, which is highlighted in yellow there. The need for the project stemmed from two areas of bottleneck within the patient flow within the hospital. First, the emergency department beds were taken up by 23-hour observation pa uh, patients, not allowing for patients to flow in and out of the ED. The second, since the 23-hour access to infusions were typically completed within inpatient unit rooms, the wait time could be hours for an inpatient bed to allow for these outpatient infusions. This new business model that the hospital was looking at, it was an approach of combining the observation and infusion unit that could allow for shared staff and shared support services throughout. 
Our first step after the client finalized the functional program with the design team was to meet with our AHJ. The former emergency department was renovated into a 32 bay observation unit for 23 hour care, which is shown in the pale yellow. This location was ideal with adjacencies next to radiology, which included an MRI, and the lab. And these highlighted need times for, um, in order for a patient to be, go from either observation or be released under the protocols that they set. If admitted, the inpatient elevator was easily accessible, and the former ambulance entrance, which is highlighted in the blue arrows in the lower left-hand corner, allows for easy family pickup if transferred out or if transport ambulances to long-term care facilities were required. This required easy access without going through the entire hospital. The six bay infusion unit shown in the bright yellow services outpatients, which were typically repeat patients and are able to access the unit through the side entrance door, again, the blue arrows. If required, infusions can overflow into the observation bays, providing flexibility, and patients from long-term care facilities can access through the former ambulance entrance and take advantage of the observation stretcher bays instead of the infusion chair bays. Since infusions can be high risk, even in an outpatient setting, especially for long-term care patients, this design decreases the risk by providing it within a hospital setting if anything happens. The infusion unit and observation unit share a waiting room, staff lounge, soiled holding, soiled utility rooms, clean supply, environmental services, nourishment rooms. The benefits that we talked through with our AHJ included staff coverage, because it was 23 hour, shared services, so we didn't have to have multiple locations of clean soiled rooms, location of radiology and lab to maintain protocols for decision making. Some of the challenges that we walked through with the AHJ were the recommended approach to include different patient types adjacent to each other. You know, and Kirsten, I, I think with a good functional program and plans like you've got highlighted here that show which areas are used for which functions and maybe which areas are shared, uh, it is a great approach to take to the AHJ because we, we're often trying to uh, get our arms around uh, this program. And if you got that functional program and, and that set of, of clear plans that, that really helps uh, describe for us and help us understand how we're going to apply the FGI to this particular facility. I agree. When we were meeting with the AHJ, it was um, important to have the overall plan, understand how patients and materials were distributed, and then also um, making sure that we had an entire checklist um, to go through the reference chapters. So we went through the 2.6 chapter, which references the infusion centers, and 2.8, um, which was the freestanding emergency care, which had the observation unit component within that, making sure he understood which sections that we were expecting to share and which ones would be separate um, in through that process. One item to note that, that we did bring up that was a highlight was we had a, a waiting room within the center of the plan and it served as a reception for infusion but which was nice to actually have somebody there if somebody was coming in as a family member for observation, the receptionist was there to guide them if they were lost or if they had questions. If we only had an observation unit, we might just have a waiting room without any type of reception or guest services associated with that. So these were benefits that we reviewed with the AHJ and, and really explained to him um, why it was um, it was a benefit not only to staff um, and patients, but also for families and support people um, within the care services and team. Our second case study includes pediatric services for a combined infusion and procedure center for 
primarily outpatient services with some inpatient procedures. So the red arrow indicates the main entrance to the hospital and the green outline indicates the location within the building. And the reason why I bring that up is just so that um, the reason why this um, pediatric infusion and procedure center was located here within a hospital setting is so that it would have easy access to the main entrance. The department was split into two separate areas, but it's important to realize that they have direct access to each other. The yellow in the plan represents the infusion unit which has uh, mainly three exam rooms and three infusion bays, plus a family support space that the infusion patients can go out to and support spaces within that, like nurse stations and med rooms. The green indicates the procedure suite with eight prep recovery bays and two procedure rooms. The area highlighted in blue is the shared services, which included reception, staff lounge, soil utility, clean supplies, environmental services, and child life offices. Now our discussion points with our AHJ for patient and family benefits, it really since the volumes cannot justify a separate inpatient and outpatient center, combining these services allowed the care to stay within the region of this hospital. The infusion patients and families were located within an adult cancer center and pulling them out into a dedicated pediatric space allowed for amenities such as dedicated family areas, access to a dedicated pediatric care team, and specialized pediatric anesthesiologists, doctors, nurses were able to work more efficiently within the hospital. The infusion patients were also used the procedure rooms, so allowing the infusion patients to have access and accessibility of the exam rooms and procedure rooms was an easy transfer for both families and patients and staff. The infusion patients check in at the shared reception desk, which is highlighted in the left of the document in blue, and they wait in the dedicated area in yellow up above at the top. Now, it was interesting in going through the design, while the pediatric groups wanted to be together, the infusion patients wanted to be separate and in an enclosed area due to the immune uh, compromised patients that they had. Now, these patients typically use height weight in exam rooms and the infusion bays, and it was important to have an open infusion bay as we went through this. And this was a discussion with the AHJ to make sure that they that they were patients were allowed to walk out into these open areas. Now the procedure patients also check into this shared reception desk and wait within their own dedicated area, which is highlighted in green. And the procedures were performed within uh, with anesthesia, and we negotiated with our AHJ to have low returns in these procedure rooms. Even though they were not operating rooms, they were using gases and required space for the equipment and HVAC. The headwall gases also matched the inpatient requirements. And keep in mind that the procedure rooms that were located in these facilities are located off an unrestricted corridor. Now, the benefits of having all of this, these services together include staff coverage, shared services, and access to both inpatient and outpatients. Now, the challenges were really um, in order to keep the two patient populations together and also having inpatients and outpatients together. So, as, as an AHJ, I, I think this is a great case to make for use of, of, of approach to, because you've got a special patient population. Pediatrics, we, we, we want to keep uh, secure for one, for one reason uh, and, and co-located, um, and, and, and this is a great example of how you can illustrate the special need of a special population and make the case for the flexibility uh, uh, of, of 
putting all of these folks in one spot. And of course, when you have uh, overlapping functions, you have overlapping requirements. Uh, and, and as Kirsten noted, often the most stringent requirement is going to apply. So a clear functional program and great plans like this are, are going to help the AHJ understand that and be able to clearly delineate on the plan uh, what, what that most stringent function is going to be and what that most stringent requirement is going to be. So uh, we can all be comfortable with those decisions as the design moves forward. Now, when we met with our AHJ, um, we we had the plan that you see before you that's highlighting the the actual clinical departments and the shared services. But again, what was also very important was to clearly lay out which chapters we were referring to um, and sections. So the chapters, just for reference. Um, was 2.2, which was the general and specialty medical services and facilities. That was for the exam and consults. 2.6, which covered for the infusion centers. We did reference um, 2.7 surgery facilities to walk through his, um, his desire and need for the low returns, and then referred to the endoscopy facilities, 2.9, um, for the procedures. A good point to make here as well is all of those uh, facility type chapters that Kirsten just listed are going to have different references back to the common elements chapter. So uh, with surgery, we may pay a lot more attention to ventilation, uh, but with general and uh, specialty medical service facilities, we might not pay as much. So it's important to walk through all of those links back to general requirements and make pretty mindful decisions and, and, and pragmatic decisions about where we're going to pay attention to the infrastructure systems like HVAC and where are we going to pay a lot more attention to medical gas systems. Um, I think one of the great things about uh, the current code development environment that's going on is this risk-based assessment isn't just happening within the FGI, but it's also happening uh, in NFPA 99 and NFPA 101, the International Code Council's uh, uh, building code and fire code, so that we're all evolving to this sense of being able to look and, and make much better decisions and, and um, cut the pie a little bit uh, thinner when, when we talk about deciding where we spend money in a building and where we focus our efforts in uh, protecting patients. So the, the image on the left-hand side um, highlights the reception desk and then the open waiting for procedures. For infusions, you follow the, the blue lights around and there's a door that you can follow in for that enclosed waiting space. But again, providing that shared reception desk, you don't have to have the, the duplicative staff and services that to be honest, this project wouldn't have gone ahead if they couldn't move in together because the business case couldn't afford it. The upper right hand image shows that open infusion area. We had discussions with our AHJ in regards to having a staff nurse station looking directly across from that so that they can be able to make sure that they have folks watching um, those patients. And that was a negotiation in order to make that space work as a clinical space. Our next case study and final case study combines uh, infusions, lab, pharmacy, and exam consult sweeps as primary care. The central core, which is shown in blue, provides circulation and waiting area. And this open concept provides a great wayfinding and natural light within the space, as you can tell from the picture on the right. Now, our discussions with the AHJ really included um, a shared waiting area along that corridor. And again, it's mixed populations um, that we had there um, to make sure that, that that was acceptable for him. The pharmacy and lab were provided on site. You know, they're dedicated to the infusion area, but also available for the other services. And the infusions and exams and the consults were split into these two instead of being combined, which was the negotiation with the HJ and as part of the design itself. 
And you know, uh, Kirsten, uh, just looking at the pharmacy uh, block there in the middle, uh, th this is a real uh, topical uh, conversation to have because we, we see a lot of these general facilities uh, adding in pharmacies and um, a lot of them are coming back and uh, deciding to upgrade their pharmacies to be USP 797 compliant. Uh, if I were to just pick up the FGI and do a general primary care um, approach and, and use approach num number one, I might not get that linkage back to pay special attention to the pharmacy or pay special attention to the ventilation. So not only is it a great tool for facilities who are uh, looking at a, a broad range of different services, but it also can help you uh, think about how things progress over time and how functions change and uh, maybe highlights some requirements and some thought processes uh, that are good for the planning process um, as well as the, the design development process. So for this um, particular, it's a good point that you made because um, since this has been open, we are now looking at relocating the pharmacy to the upper floor to, because we don't have enough space to make that compliant. Um, and also the lab is also needs to be increased. So the flexibility within this building and the way it was laid out was key um, in order to provide those um, spaces. There's an upper floor that, that has administrative space that was always thought for, for those future um, services. So this um, allows us to, to um, react to those upcoming code changes. When we reviewed this, uh, with the HJ um, chapter 2.2, which was the general and specialty medical facilities was reviewed. And then the infusion center um, component uh, was also reviewed with him um, as we went through that. So back to our friend Frankenstein, um, this, this whole concept of uh, flexibility and engineering some way into the FGI guidelines to provide a different way to uh, look at facilities and have a sort of nonlinear approach to uh, determining what the risks and the requirements are based on the service type. We hope this is going to be a great tool to put in your toolkit uh, as you move forward and uh, work with your facilities, uh, work with your designers, and work with your AHJs. All right, thanks Kirsten and John for this great conversation on the 2018 outpatient document and the two approaches to using it. Uh, I've got a couple of follow-up questions for you. Uh, first one, hospitals have all sorts of requirements for special power, HVAC, plumbing, et cetera. What kind of infrastructure requirements do the guidelines require in outpatient facilities? Um. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, it, it's kind of dependent on the facility type and services provided. Uh, most of those infrastructure requirements are either going to show up in the common elements uh, chapter in 2.1 or they're going to be in part three for ventilation. Most of these infrastructure requirements, though, uh, can be derived from other codes like NFPA 99, the healthcare facility codes. Um, some of them, though, originate here. But in, in either case, uh, there is going to be some direction or, or at least some option to look at a risk-based methodology for determining what the building needs. Again, I, I think it goes back to this uh, unified code concept that, that's been out there for a while. Both NFPA and 99 and, and the FGI are, are going with this risk-based approach. And um, I, I think if you, you identify that, that set of risk, um, they're going to lead you down similar paths. And I, I think that's one of the exciting things that we'll start to see over the next couple of years as we start to use these new versions of codes. Okay, thanks. So it's pretty common for facilities to change function over time. How do the guidelines address that? So I, I would say um, the the FGI is a set of minimum standards that are based on the service type, and, and when I say service type, that, that implies the risk uh, that exists inside of the facility. Um, so 
how you deal with that functional drift of from a from an approved condition to a non-approved use is probably best going to be uh, addressed with the AHJ or the person that enforces the uh, the FGI guidelines on your facility. Um, I think a, a, a significant change of use, uh, you're going to have to pay attention to that. Like if you're changing from a, a, a conference room to a toe surgery clinic, you're, you're going to have to uh, pay attention and, and understand that uh, toe surgery is going to have all sorts of requirements in the FGI that would not have been applied to the conference room. So that that I think is 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 comes up more on the inspection side of things, but it's a good conversation to have with your AHJ. And um, I think it's a valuable uh, piece of advice that I that I got from a facility here in Washington State um, to keep a current copy of your functional program, not only after you complete the project, but keep it in your files so that you can go back and refer to it and update it as functions change over time. I, I completely agree with you, John, and I think there's um, it, it's a common um, time for me when I go out to take a look for, at a facility and they typically ask, hey, we just want you to come out and take a look at because we want to add a few exam rooms. And next thing I know, I'm going through rooms that used to be offices that are being used as an exam rooms. And it's really about educating um, the, the clinicians, the physicians, um, and even the facilities, um, project managers, um, as you go through talking about the change of use requirements and um, changing that to go through to be with um, the going through that with the AHJ. Um, there's a lot of negotiation in regards to saying, well, we have this exam room and it was approved 20 years ago, but, you know, that's not going to meet today's requirements. And if you want to add new exam rooms, we have to make sure that we're complying to the current codes. So a lot of times it's a, it's it's walking through, it's, it's going through and making sure they have that education and making sure you're helping them define that functional program. Right, and I think it probably happens on an individual project. Uh, you start start the project with one medical director, and halfway through construction, you get a new one. Uh, you might get a new uh, perspective on on what the facility wants uh, in that space. So uh, we've we've seen that happen too. So how does this change in function work with the Frankenstein approach? Uh, it seems like you're designing something that's pretty specific, built around today's use. Are you putting the facility at risk when you create too specific of a design? No, I think that, that this is, you know, this is a common challenge that we're facing a, across every project because of the technology is changing, uh, the clinical services are changing. Um, but approach two, you know, you really allowed to get, you know, specific in some higher level. Um, expansive building systems in one area of that building, but not the other. Um, it really provides more flexibility as you go throughout. Um, a lot of times with approach two, um, you can talk about rooms being used for multiple functions. And with those multiple functions, you're using, um, again, the higher degree um, of requirements. So for example, a procedure room could be used as an exam room if you wanted to, um, but an uh, exam room can't be used as a procedure room. So again, it's the education around where that flexibility lies. Right, right. And, and, and it really sort of works both ways because if you're designing to the more stringent requirement now, uh, I, I think you, you really kind of set the facility up uh, uh, for a lot of flexibility in the future. Uh, but approach two, you could... Uh, use it to identify and say, okay, this one expensive um, detailed infrastructure system is only going to exist in these very few rooms. Um, and that works great when you open the building, but five years later, when you want to expand that service and move out into other portions of the building, uh, you, you may be limited on what you can do with that space um, outright. You, you may be looking at another construction project. But it's the benefit and the challenge, and I, I think we've we've seen that with with any building project uh, over the, the past couple of years. Thanks. 
So if you're planning on using this, how do you bring this how do you bring up this approach with your AHJ? What what do you recommend? Well, I, I, I think yeah, you're as soon as you know you're going through a project type where um you know there's gray areas and there's things that you want to talk about with your AHJ, make an appointment um with them in order to make sure you can have that conversation. Um, just submitting a plan uh, with a functional program uh, isn't going to um, probably serve the best intent. Um, having a conversation with them early in design, you're going to be able to, to go through what the intent is and make the age aware of the way that you're approaching the project. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I... I think that um, many designers and many AHJs may have kind of used this concept in the past, just sort of intuitively, because you know you identify different risks in in, in different sections of the book. Um, so it may not be a, a, a surprise to some, but for some it may be a new concept. Um, and I I think you've 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 got to understand that AHJs are, are like you are really busy. Uh, and may not have the time uh, and resources for a lot of back and forth uh, when you introduce this concept. So I would advise, uh, like Kirsten said, meet early as soon as you identify it and uh, come to that meeting uh, prepared um, and have all of your ducks in a row, have, have a pretty clear understanding of what the functions are going to be, what the goals of the program are going to be. And um, when, whenever you present it, I, I don't expect a blanket approval to do whatever you want uh, with little documentation. Don't come in and say, hey, it's approach two. I can do whatever I want to. Uh, I don't think that was the intent for how this was to be used. Uh, approach two takes interaction and it takes documentation and it takes uh, a commitment um, to acknowledging that if the services change, uh, the needs and the requirements of that space may need to change um, down the road. Okay, thanks for that. So you've mentioned the functional program a number of times throughout this presentation, and it seems obvious that a functional program is absolutely critical when you're using the second approach, uh, the Frankenstein model. Um, what if I am doing an infusion center? Are the requirements straightforward enough that I can just skip the functional program? No. Absolutely not. <laughs> I think the um, I'm sorry, John. I couldn't hear you. What was that? Uh, the functional program is the is the key to understanding either one of these approaches, I believe, because um, in either case, uh, the designer is going to have to understand the goals of the uh, program and the facility, uh, and the AHJ uh, is, is going to have to understand uh, what the services are and what the risks are. Uh, and able to appropriately apply the guidelines. So I, I think uh, having a functional program is, is key for most projects. And it, it could be re really, really short uh, for, for simple projects. It could be very complex for uh, the, the larger, uh, more detailed facilities. Yeah, the, the floor plan can only show so much. It's really that functional program that's going to identify the patient population that the clinic is serving, uh, how patients are coming and going from these facilities, um, and what types of um, support spaces are being used and shared and other things. So that, that's definitely a requirement for every project. Is FGI considering additional facility types in the next edition of the outpatient guidelines? You know that that's always a good conversation to have. Uh, we've we've got these dozen or so facility chapters, but um, the guidelines uh, undergoes a continual uh, process where where we consider uh, proposals. Um, there is a four-year cycle, um, and a great um, uh, way of checking in to see where we are on that is go to the FGI guidelines website. Uh, see where we are in the revision cycles, and anyone can can make a proposal um, uh, during the revision cycle to to make a change, to add a chapter, to add a service, uh, and, and we encourage that. I, I think when we reach out to facilities and designers, uh, that's where we get our best ideas. Uh, so 
So I, I would encourage folks to make those kind of proposals. I've got time for one more question, and I think that this is one that a lot of people are curious about. Uh, do you expect FGI to go to four books next time? There was one book in 2010, two books in 2014, and now with the outpatient book, three in 2018. So does that mean there's going to be four for 2022? <laughs> That's, that's I, I, not the intent. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I think when when you look at hospitals, residential facilities, and outpatient facilities, you you get that broad breadth. I think the outpatient book itself, you know, kind of acknowledges that that it is a a, a different world and a different set of tasks. But it's um, um, I, I think we're set for now. <laughs> Great. All right. Thanks. That's uh, that's all the time we have for Q&A. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, John, for a great presentation and really informative Q&A session. So for AIA Continuing Education Credit, please remember to see the person who registered your site at the close of this for more information on receiving learning units or a certificate. You must be registered through MADCAD to take the survey and obtain credit. Here's a look at the complete webinar series that FGI is offering on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction documents. We hope that you'll be able to join us for each of the presentations. Sign up for our quarterly newsletter, the FGI Bulletin, or follow us on LinkedIn to keep abreast of what's happening at FGI, including updates on adoption, errata, and the 2022 revision cycle. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great day. <laughs>